Hey everybody, welcome to week seven on Tavistock group therapy. And uh, this group theory, I'm gonna run through pretty quick. Uh, it's not that it's a simple theory, but uh, it is one of the first initial theories that was made. And so um, a lot of the themes we may have covered in like different chapters or different previous seminars, uh, but there's some concepts that I think stand out in Tavistock and some core assumptions about uh, group therapy that I think are helpful to reflect on. So uh, as we've done before, there'll be some brief descriptions of the history of the theory, the core concepts, differences between the approach and traditional interpersonal groups, some interventions, traits by the leader, and also be trying to do this from a social justice anti-racist frame to try and highlight some considerations for the theoretical content and interventions. So Tavistock is uh, given credit uh, to Bion, 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 uh, who wrote a seminal book publication. Well, it was his published work like years later and then in 1961, Experiences in Group. Um, Ezreal actually like came after him uh, and expanded on his work. Uh, and so those uh, two kind of focused on some unconscious psychodynamic patterns of groups and uh, talked about different kinds of uh, relationships or basic assumptions within the group frame. So uh, there's two primary articles that I think I used for this, uh, as well as the book, Experiences in Group with Beyond. So again, sociocultural transference and context. Uh, this group theory, like many, is based in you know, a, a lot of Eurocentric uh, norms and uh, I believe uh, beyond in his book, there's maybe only one reference to, um, mm, there's no reference to identities of the people in there from a racial ethnicity like standpoint. I believe one time he has a member that says like we should use Christian surnames uh, to identify each other. And, and someone says, I don't believe in that. And that's not something I have, um, which is probably the only like diversity factor I think that comes up and it's not really mentioned or explored beyond that. Um, theirs was a focus again at the origin of these theories that was very colorblind and very much like a encompassing all as uh, the individualistic focus rather than focusing on the socio-cultural context. So uh, that is part that is in all of us and in all the transference that we have. And so my um, hope is to represent some of that in the discussions today. Uh, but if I miss any opportunities, which I'm sure there's always more to add, like for representation, microaggressions, or others, feel free to email me and continue to have that dialogue and work through those things. So uh, Tavistock, the too long, didn't watch, like overview. Uh, essentially, the focus is on the group as a whole only. Uh, everything in the group, everything that the members do is an unconscious desire uh, of the group members. And so the basic assumptions to be mindful of are there's three main ones. There's actually like five or maybe six, depending on who you read, um, that have been expanded on. But three ones that Beyond did were dependency, fight, flight, and pairing. Uh, dependency is essentially like the classroom like uh, mentality or a doctor patient mentality where everyone's in the group, everyone's looking at me, I'm the one with all the answers, they're only going to talk to me. Nobody else in the room really matters because obviously me with the degree, I'm the only one who could actually help them. Uh, and so that is something, all these assumptions are really normal. They happen in almost every group. So don't take this as, oh no, I'm doing a terrible job. I mean, it's something to be mindful of and to attend to, but this is something like of the phenomenon that uh, occur in all the groups that you learn in this like kind of process oriented manner. Um, the other uh, two are fight flight, uh, which uh, can take kind of two forms in the sense of like hating a particular human object, uh, like the leader and, and kind of disdaining, you know, the, the group doesn't work or this person doesn't know what he's doing and kind of dismissing or discrediting that and people like, you know, energizing around that dissent um, or the flight, which is like, you know, there's a feared object and running away from the task at hand. So if we're in this group to talk about our thoughts and our feelings, what we'll do instead is we'll talk about, you know, the weather and how great this cooking recipe is. And, oh my God, look at that cute baby Yoda behind you and all that. And so they'll uh, just get flying away from the task uh, as fast as they can because of the anxiety associated with it. And then pairing, 
Each pairing is like when you have a dyad, and this happens a lot, uh, where two people in a group have this back and forth dynamic. Um, and it can be of any gender identity pair. Uh, it doesn't have to be like um, any particular identities with it, but essentially that they get into a back and forth. Sometimes it's conflictual, sometimes it's harmonious, or like we have a shared trauma and we can really understand and connect with each other, or like they're processing something between each other. It's really meaningful. And the rest of the group members are just sitting back and eating popcorn. They're just, just watching it. It's a lovely scene. You don't wanna disturb the actors, actresses, anyone. You just wanna take it in because God, if these two get together, oh, it's gonna be so worth it that I came to this group. It's gonna be so sweet. Beyond talks about it from the space of like, you know, it is like a sexual, even though it's not male, female, particularly, he says it could be any gender, but that there's like a sexual energy to it. Um, and again, this like almost fantasy, he says of like, if these two merge together, then there'll be a new life that's formed, like a new baby, like something that makes the group worthwhile, something that is like, we made something of this group. And that's wonderful. It's actually not because uh, although that might feel really great in the moment for people and might be again, like really great popcorn uh, movie watching, uh, that's something. And I like uh, would say, you know, we need to engage other members in that, whether that's bridging them, mentalizing, having them be able to like jump in and say like, what do you think is going on? Or how are we feeling about the dynamic that's been shown so far between these two, like getting people into the, into the fray of that. And I'll, I will joke and use that popcorn analogy in groups. Um, you know, again, just to make lightheartedness of like uh, the, the scene, like I feel like the rest of the group is eating popcorn while these two talk. Like, can we get some like discourse? So what are people's feelings about what's been happening so far? You know, just trying to, again, have it be more dynamic than that. Uh, but Tavistock doesn't do any of that. So again, I'm trying to mm, differentiate between what I would want to do normally with these assumptions in regular groups and what Tavistock would do. Tavistock's just commenting that they're seeing this phenomenon and the group does whatever it will with that. But the group leader, um, like Beyond, is essentially kind of aloof, kind of just um, not present within the space. Like if this is the group circle, then uh, you know every member is kind of in that circle. Beyond's like here, he's like outside the group, literally they place their chair outside of the group circle and they just talk like to the group. So nobody's actually looking at them, the leader in this. I guess the equivalent in Zoom would be the person having their video off, like, you know, because essentially you just hear this person speaking about, uh, seems like the group is really afraid to move beyond these two members, like uh, pairing up with one another and thinking that that will solve other problems. Like if these two work something out. And uh, that's kind of like, you know, the movie screen, you're just kind of seeing this theme pop up every so often in your consciousness. And then, you know, you're kind of left to your own devices with that. Now, um, it's if you ever get a chance to read experiences in group, I mean, I was able to like find a way to download it into an app that could like uh, create an audio file for it. So I was able to listen to it. It's a very, it's an interesting listen. Um, it's, it's really kind of cool because beyond like, it really does feel like the first person to ever kind of see this phenomenon and record it. And it's so reassuring in some ways to say like, oh yeah, that, that happens like all the time still in these groups that we run. And um, he has an aloofness and a curiosity to him uh, where it's not like he's confident in what he's saying, but he's, he's doing it with such like determination. Uh, you can really admire uh, the, you know, the grit that he has in trying to really flesh this, these concepts out, which have never been really thought about before. Like what happens when groups are left to their own devices. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, what that Northfield experiment was after this too long didn't watch thing. But the anti-task group and the work group, essentially just opposites. Anti-task is people that are not on task, doing all those kinds of things and the assumptions that we talked about before, you know, dismissing, distracting, like, uh, you know, trying to run away from the topics, trying to um, basically make, make the group not function in different ways. And we'll go into more details about that. And then the work group, which is a, a working group, um, and he calls it a sophisticated group. I don't think that has to do with like sophistication and intelligence. It's just more about 
a group that can be authentic with their experiences and work together to solve a problem or to be curious about whatever their task is. Uh, because again, like his group task was, I want to study group dynamics. Like um, that was his actual purpose. It wasn't like, I want to make you less depressed. So um, oftentimes people got frustrated at, because I think they had a differential expectation than what uh, he had set up in that. And uh, we'll talk about that more, but essentially um, this last piece is more of a mm, extension of Beyond's work. Um, I think this is from Ezreal actually, uh, but essentially it bre breaks it down into like three main sections for psychoanalytic Tavistock group. Um, you start to ask yourself as the group unfolds and starts discussing or being silent, whatever, what's the group talking about? So when they ask me like, how does this group work? They're engaging me as the leader because they feel like, again, in that dependency, I am the required relationship. They have to like depend on me. I'm the only one who knows what to do and how to make things better. And um, which makes sense on some level, right? Like that they would assume that. And then um, what enables them to avoid the expression of something else, like their anger, their dependency, their helplessness, uh, the avoided relationship, right? Like I cling to the leader because I don't want to feel helpless. And if I'm dependent on you and you're strong and you're smart, then I don't have to sit with my helplessness. I can just be with you and listen to you and be like in that. Um, and then what do they fear might happen if they engage in the avoided expression? Now that can be like, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting the way this is set up because it, it does coalesce with how I kind of view things from the sense of emotional avoidance since many emotions like anger helplessness, I don't know that I would call dependency an emotion, but um, like fear, like a rejection, right? Fear of rejection might be bad, right? That might be the avoidance experience. And this is like us being curious about uh, what would happen if you engaged in it. You might be rejected, you might be embarrassed, you might feel even more hopeless or helpless. That's the calamitous relationship that we're trying to avoid. So the Tavistock practitioner, the consultant, they would call themselves consultants, I believe, uh, would be going through these kinds of things as the group discusses, you know, probably like naming the assumptions, naming the required relationships, the avoided relationship, and what's the calamitous relationship being avoided. And then again, like putting it back on the group, like really just seeing what they can work through and, and discuss together. So it's a very jarring experience because um, there's no, there's not a lot of warmness or connection with the group therapist because he's not meant to do that. That's not the goal. So super interesting though. And uh, they do these kinds of things. They have a Tavistock Institute in the, in the UK, I believe, or in Europe. Um, and uh, these things are much more kind of like, I think used and researched like overseas. Um, so a lot of value, I, I think in that. It's seen more in the business, I think consulting world, as opposed to the psychotherapeutic world, because again, it's more of a exploratory examination of your roles within a group setting with a group task, like uh, discovering your role uh, within a large group or discovering group dynamics, um, rather than like a, this is gonna make you better. And so I think there can be a lot of damage to that because again, there's no direct kinds of interventions by the leader. So if we think of isomorphy and this being a microcosm of larger society, like most groups are, um, especially if you get into larger groups, more than 15, like then the same things, the racism, the misogyny, the sexism, uh, ableism, all that, that's going to come into uh, the space. And so I'm not actually sure how Tavistock consultants would handle microaggressions as they come up. Um, if I had to guess, it'd be that they don't really like do much to it, but um, that's just based on my hard reading of these articles and theory. Uh, maybe there's more uh, modern approaches to that that I would love to learn more about if people have those perspectives. But um, that doesn't seem to be the purposefulness uh, of it again, which I think is is fine again as long as you give informed consent and expectations to people that that is what they're getting into. Which I think oftentimes we don't necessarily do that. So um, I'll speak a little bit about Beyond real quick. Uh, Beyond. Northfield experiment again was um, something that was made from I think the Second World War and soldiers returning from uh, the battlefield and, and recovery. And so he he set up this 
uh, experiments, essentially, this grand experiment where the men could all in the ward, the wing that he was in, could uh, make their own groups. They could do all kinds of like activities at different free hours during the day. Um, and so they had some groups set up, like, I don't know, um, woodworking or, you know, uh, crafts or uh, one of them suggest an interpretive dance, think to kind of stick it to Beyond and, you know, say, well, we'll make some ridiculous group. But that was fine. Beyond would let them make whatever groups they wanted. Uh, they All they needed was at least like one other person or two other people maybe to like form the group. Uh, but what they found is that some people formed groups and some people like worked on cars or, or did other kinds of things. But the groups were very scattered, very diffuse. There were maybe one or two people working in, in harmony with one another. And, um, you know, there was conflict and tension, like, in, in, as that experiment went on. Uh, but what Beyond did is they brought them all together for this 30 minute meeting just to talk about how the process was going. And this was kind of what Beyond was like doing in terms of the Tavistock-esque approach. Uh, he was really uh, eschewing all responsibility, like letting go of any responsibility if they had a complaint. And they said like, this person's not uh, doing this, or this isn't like, uh, you know, happening the way it should be. It was kind of like, a, okay, I hear that this is happening with this group members, and I'm not going to do anything like with my authority about that. So as like, that's kind of like some of the inception of like the early days of that experiment. But then beyond kind of uh, those meetings over months, you know, started to take on a life of their own, and he started to become like known for these groups that he would run. Um, and so people would come into his groups and be all like wide-eyed and excited and like, oh my gosh, the great Dr. Beyond, like heard so many good things about you. And, you know, you're, you're really well lauded for these groups. And, um, you know, they're all just like looking in anticipation, like all there and he's just unresponsive. And then once they kind of like sit in silence and then ask like, we're we supposed to be doing something? Has it started yet? Uh, he would just kind of like be silent and Maybe again, make one of those whole comments. It seems like the group is really looking for me to solve their problems for them. Uh, and you know that would obviously lead to people being angry and confused. And so there would be splitting and, and schisms among the members where some would be like, why, why would you like, you know, not do anything? Like he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then other group members would be like, hold on, hold on. Like Dr. Beyond's clearly like his, his name is well renowned. Obviously, this is part of it. And so, you know, there's something to this. Uh, and, you know, that was like, oh, good. Oh, okay, you're right, you're right. There's a reason why this is. So then they would be comforted by that dependency on Beyond again. And then he would just make another comment on, it seems like the group is really set on uh, assuming that I'm gonna be the one to fix them. Like, and, like uh, regardless of uh, my ineptitude or what I am not providing the group, the group continues to be dependent on me to be the one to fix them or do anything. And that would just make them more, angry and furious again, like because uh, we're so desperate for that dependency um, in some ways. So it's fascinating in a way because part of what I've been speaking to a lot in these group theory seminars is the idea of the, the systems versus the individualistic approach. So a lot of group theories focus on the individual and make it very individualistic in terms of their deficits and their dysfunction. And um, Tavistock still kind of does that. Like, so it's not, you know, the, the holy grail by any means. Um, however, the study of it is that the group is the foreground in a sense, right? Um, that instead of overlooking the group or the system of like folks and their interactions, um, we're kind of talking about and noticing how the dynamics of the group are pulling people to be in certain ways and to act in certain ways. Uh, rather than focusing on the responsibility as an individual, individual like in your bootstrap mentality, you control your destiny, you pull yourself up by it, and you're the reason for all your success, and you're also the reason for all your failures. So that really sucks. Like, get away from that um, in this, because uh, again, you kind of start to see that depending on the setting, depending on the group and the culture, uh, you react a lot differently. Uh, and so I think that feels self-evident in some ways, but when you think about all the things that we blame ourselves for in terms of our symptoms of our emotions, sadness, of, of fear, uh, then that can be uh, really problematic because we personalize all of those things and don't think about the systemic effects of, you know, my, uh, the oppression of uh, the job that I work at or the, 
microaggressions that I like go throughout the day and may face, you know, those are all secondary to, you know, what, um, what we take as our responsibility. So, mm, interesting like thought, when does group begin? And uh, you know, Beyond again has this view, I think similar in object relations as well, where uh, the group's always going. Uh, and you know, in a sense that's true, we're always in groups, we're always like in interactions with our social cultural environment. I would, I would agree with that. And so um, you know, whenever there's you know, uh, interactions between group members, uh, then there's uh, this investment in energy and there becomes this point of like, do I wanna lose my individualism like to be a part of this collective or do I wanna not join? And so there becomes like this push and pull uh, and then there becomes maybe a common group task that emerges where we're all here to help this person or we're here to work on this like you know, protocol at work. And uh, you know that, that can lead to a productive like working environment in some cases when there's a group task that everybody can be focused on. Um, but is there a group in the waiting room that people as they interact, um, as they like distance themselves or don't introduce or don't talk, like what does that say and what does that speak to in terms of their dynamics? And again, if there's pairings, like it's fascinating, you know, again, um, how when you walk into a room with people, which you may be able to do soon, yay. Like uh, when we have groups in person again and we walk into rooms, it's interesting to see about where do people sit? Like where is the division by gender? Sometimes that happens by race, ethnicity, by other kinds of factors. Like you can kind of see like these schisms and divisions um, that all speak to like these sociocultural like uh, processes and dynamics that may be at play. And, um, you know, as, as working in the group as a whole, you just wanna be able to name what you're seeing in that way. So there's three levels of interpretation, like typically when I talk about group interventions with people, intrapsychic, and that's like within the individual, the reasons that are happening is because of personality characteristics. Um, Vinny is fearful of rejection and caretaking because he did not gain attention from people growing up. So I would say again, um, it's not really, <laughs> it's not like my fault that I didn't get taken care of or get attention from people growing up, uh, but like the fear is internal. And so if I'm asking a question to myself, I would be like, Vinny, how are you feeling right now? And you've been really quiet. Like that would be an intrapsychic or interpersonal, intrapersonal intervention. Interpersonal is utilizing two different people and the difficulties are caused by the interaction like between them. So Vinny is arguing because his personality clashes with Misha, you know, uh, and then the group as a whole, like dynamic would be the group object is the uh, item of inquiry. So uh, when we take out somebody in the group because we think of them as problematic, uh, oftentimes like, uh, you know, the group can scapegoat or they can have a, have a thing where, oh, if this person just wasn't here, everything would be better. But then sometimes when they like replace someone, uh, then things actually don't get better. Uh, they're actually the same, like uh, because we've just changed and sucked a new person into the role that that old one had to fill. And I've had this happen in good ways too. Like I've had members, you know, um, you know, graduate or move on, like from my process groups in private practice, and then noticing people start to notice like that this person is acting more like this person was, you know, and, and saying like, oh, you're taking on that role of um, the person who used to really check in on others and be the caretaker. And so now we have a new like role that's fitting into that. So if the caretaking was a problem, it wouldn't go away with the member leaving. Uh, there's something about the group that is calling for a person to take care of uh, others and to notice why that's happening or be curious about that. I think it'd be really helpful what dynamics are at play with that. Um, so the group member's behavior, again, everything is in interpretable and intentional. So uh, if you're eating, then, uh, you know, there's an explanation like for that, right? Like you're hungry for something, like uh, maybe in a session, like you want to be fed, like in this group, you don't feel like the group can feed you enough. And so you're starting to eat. And so that uh, process um, is more, again, explaining things for the entire group, not just for the one person, because I mean, the one person is a representative of the larger group dynamic. Um, so two social defense mechanisms they talk about, we've gone over these in different ways. Projection, uh, I don't wanna feel it, I don't wanna be it. And so I push that projection onto somebody else. 
um, like in some way, like, oh, you're, you're angry, but I'm actually the one who's angry, like um, in that way. Projective identification, I think this is like a really key thing to, to reflect on, especially when we're talking about inter, uh, intergroup dialogues on uh, race or racism and uh, you know, just difficult conversations in general. When you have uncomfortable thoughts and feelings that get projected into another person, like I don't think this is actually um, like problematic or uh, something that's a negative. I think this is actually like a really, uh, a really interesting, like, mm, I'm trying not to use primal or primitive because it has such negative connotations and soften use in this literature. Um, I think it's a unique part of us as humans where we try and connect with and communicate with one another on in a nonverbal, like, you know, or maybe even verbal way um, so that we're not alone with our suffering. Uh, so the idea is if you have thoughts or feelings and you don't wanna feel them alone, you'll act in such a way to put those feelings into somebody else and they'll feel it for you. Um, so a simple like metaphor would be like uh, when I had like Sonia on the baby monitor, um, if she would cry, I would feel the sadness and despair like in distress and maybe lack of sleep inside of me. Um, and that would be really tough to have that distress projected into you, right? That's why mom and like uh, dads and other parents, like their hearts sink like when that happens. Um, and that's, you know, not because the baby is evil. It just is like, those fools, I will make them suffer for what they've done to me. But just because it doesn't wanna be alone, right? I say it, uh, the baby doesn't want to be alone. And uh, the baby wants to be like heard and, and cared for and, and picked up. And so again, like by feeling that sadness, by feeling that I feel so alone, which I think the baby cries and, and conveys to the parent, the parent doesn't wanna feel alone doesn't want the baby to feel alone and they pick them up and they hold them or you don't because that's terrible to do. And I don't know, baby books, you know, give different advice on things, but um, that's the basic like picture of it. I would say, you know, again, when we're doing difficult dialogues on uh, racism and uh, if someone is having a discussion and being accused of a microaggression and they feel like, you know what, like I can't do anything right. I'm walking on eggshells here. Um, no matter what I do, I'm always seen as like a villain, as a white person, like then mm, maybe since this is not a normal emotion that you experience all these like phenomena that you're naming right now, we could be curious about how, uh, what the people of color with this uh, other member uh, is conveying to you is uh, they're trying to help you understand their inner suffering and what they've been through throughout their life, throughout different moments of oppression, of racism. And so like really taking that in and depersonalizing it, being able to say like, if this feeling is so intense, start to ask like whoever I'm talking to, could this be what they're feeling internally? Could they be trying to connect with me in a way? And this is the only way they know how to do it because I'm not gonna get it otherwise, or maybe they can't convey that helplessness, that sadness, that you know, uh, feeling like I'm on eggshells or not doing anything right? Like, how do you convey a lifetime of that? Um, there's not really an easy way to do it. So I think if you can hold that in mind, uh, it's actually a really, like, you know, warming experience to feel like, wow, I'm really, I'm connecting with this person's humanity and their, their suffering, uh, and that can make it really personal. So um, that was a little of a side, but I really love just thinking of projective identification as a tool to use in these racial dialogues. And I feel like I don't hear people talk about it as much used in that sense. But um, back to Tavistock-esque things. Group defenses maintain survival. People are assigned in formal roles. And again, like people may act in certain manners for that group. Like some person might be responsible for the feelings in the group um, or, or the, like if they're the only ones that seem to get tearful, then that might be something that centers around them. And again, this role suction, this group members are manipulated and pressured into a needed role. And uh, if a African-American uh, like or black man like comes into group. And uh, again, I feel like this has happened in my groups where, you know, there's been members who have been in previous groups that have come in and many of them really wanting the group to go deeper, um, but, you know, the group not being responsive to it. And so the member who happened to be a black male, like uh, expressed like some passionate statements around like how meaningful this was and how much depth 
we've been in before and just really wanting people to be honest with him, like when something perturbs them or when, you know, just to be real, like in that, um, because we're not real so much of the time. Um, and that's like given like the labels of anger and kind of seen in this like scary, intimidating way, whereas a white member, a male member will be seen in a more intellectual and like welcoming way. Uh, and so again, like there's almost like, because the group's not responsive to uh, certain members, then it pulls someone to like, feel like, well, the only way, no one else is gonna own their anger at what's happening in this group or what's happening in this like dynamic, then I have to be the one to do it. Uh, and that I think can fall into those like um, roles or uh, stereotypes at times, which can be really frustrating to see happen. Scapegoating, again, is that idea of putting all the sins and misfortune on the backs of others, uh, which I think you need to be cautious of, again, because if you are always thinking of that in concreteness and colorblindness, then uh, you can maybe miss the identities that are being present in the scapegoating. Like if a white male is being scapegoated because he said microaggressive comments to women of color uh, multiple times, and then you protect them and you tell the women of color, you know what, uh, what you're doing right now is you're putting all the sins and misfortunes on him. You're not willing to own him yourself. Uh, that's real bad, real, real not um, helpful uh, because we've essentially almost flipped the scapegoat dynamic right in that point. So trying to be a little more intentional about how you think of that. Um, and again, status like uh, in the roles that occur in these groups uh, negatively valued culture features tend to accumulate down the social ladder while positive qualities grew up. So supervisors are you know the best, doctors are seen as better than masters, like uh, that's not you know necessarily the case. I don't agree with these uh, necessarily, but again, um, these are just the ways in which society and these like sociocultural worlds we, we're in reinforce these beliefs. Um, there's low status, frequently a repository for things that are seen as dirty and seemingly dishonorable, unethical, ignorant, foolish. Um, and I would say again, like in, in the college counseling world, that would be like low status team members, front desk staff, um, or that could be again, identities like immigrants, BIPOC folks, uh, people of subjugated or marginalized identities. And uh, yeah, if you're a singleton, if you're the one female in a group of males, the dynamic's gonna be very different. If you're the one minority in a group of other like, like white identified folks, the group's gonna be, have a very different dynamic. Um, and so obviously there's benefits to having that heterogeneity of different identities and races. And, uh, but most of the time we can't really ask for those things. Like we kind of, at least in the college counseling sense, we get what we have available. And that's okay, as long as you're highlighting what kinds of dynamics can come up and you know recognizing that um, those things and naming it as it's happening, you know, instead of just pretending it's not there, pretending that this person's the only, not the only black woman in this group of um, white women, right? Or, uh, you know, again, like even others in terms of co-leadership dynamics, right? Like uh, if your co-leader has different identity characteristics than you do, then it'd be important to know that, right? I've had a black male co-leader uh, with me who again, uh, we've been treating very differently, like within the space and being curious about that and being able to name that as it's happening, not with a sense of like, how dare you, like say that I'm being too pushy, like, uh, you know, and this other person's not, uh, but more just to be like observant of these dynamics to increase awareness of how these strings from the systems we're in still pull us to, you know, act in those you know, stereotyping manners. So the working group, again, Usually it's focused on a conscious task, mission focused. So Dion would say like the goal of his groups was to focus on um, like uh, to be curious about and explore group dynamics. And uh, yeah, that I think makes sense in terms of how he ran it. And uh, I think the people that went into that group, I don't know how much they understood that. Like, I think he could have thrown out that term and they would have like just been like, that's psychobabble. I'm just assuming you're gonna make me feel less depressed because that's what, psychiatrists often do. So it's a little misleading in some ways. And again, like I, I would highlight informed consent it's really great to have for folks. Um, but if you think of it like, you know, the goal here is to understand your role and how you function within them. Um, and that can be like a really interesting experiment to be a part of. Uh, 
yeah, there's distributed authority, there's task delegated, there's shared responsibility, uh, voluntary collaboration between group members when you're in a working group or a sophisticated group, and it may be data-driven or like objective, like based on like what's happened before in that. So on the other side, anti-task groups, there's hidden agendas, uh, group becomes about making friendships, I just wanna get an A in my class, you know, they're kind of doing side stories on things. Members don't know what the primary task permission is. What's the point of this group? Authority over delegates or under delegates things. If you can imagine how this comes up in the different systems and college counseling or in hospitals and things where you're in um, or VAs. Uh, members experience low trust, lack of openness. There's a frequent inability to reach agreements uh, and they don't listen to one another. Uh, lacking accountability and responsibility. So ugh. Next time you go into some meetings, just think about how many of these things feel like they're present. And then you can just ask yourself like, oh, okay, we're an anti-task group right now. Maybe we can just name these dynamics. We can like highlight these things for folks. The basic group assumptions. The three top ones are beyonds and the other two are um, newer ones that are made by um, some other folks that are uh, not coming to me off the top of my head. Maybe I have them quoted later. Um, but I think we'll go over to them in each, each in more detail right now uh, for it. So dependency, again, like focused on someone very powerful who's going to protect the group. Doctor, patient, easiest example of that. Usually the first thing that happens in the group formation is people talk to the leader. And you'll notice that they make eye contact with you. They talk to you. They don't talk to other people. Even if they're talking about the other person, they'll, you know, say something like, oh, uh, I think what he meant when he said that was he was feeling really sad about that. And I really connected with what he talked about in his family. And so as a leader, you know, we can't really do eye contact as well, but I will say like, can you talk to him? Can you look at him? Like, can you um, speak to him, not me? Um, so again, Tavistock wouldn't care because Tavistock's not even in the group to be able to have that happen to them. Um, but I mean, uh, they would just name that again, that dependency towards the authority or the leader like state. Uh, which makes sense. They, they use a lot of analogies and metaphors like related to church and religion as like dependency is like a key needed thing. You need to believe that it's the deity that's responsible. And if something good happens, you praise God, praise the thing that you're dependent on. Um, I don't think they're trying to make a big statement about it. I think they're just highlighting the parallel in terms of like, that's the basic assumption that happens in this group. And then with like, of course, soldiers, they talk about the fight or flight being like what that shows up in. And so it wasn't obvious already. Uh, the group decides to either fight or flight against a current enemy, current problem, current person. And so if it's to survive on fighting, then it's active aggression towards someone, maybe they're scapegoating. The leadership is granted to anybody who can mobilize or you know, kind of promotes this aggressive energy of the group towards the leader. Um, and if the aim is to flee from the task, then people are passive, they avoid, they ruminate on the past and irrelevant topics, the withdrawal and stay silent. And the leadership and the energy is granted to anybody that minimizes the importance of the task. If they talk about something irrelevant and they might be given the back and forth and like asked questions about it or, oh, how would that do? And we have this happen sometimes in group where it's just like, guys, are we really talking about this right now? Are we talking about, you know, what dis dish soap detergent like you used last week? Uh, like they're very digressing conversations at times, uh, but no one acts as if there's a problem. Uh, and so part of that is being able to name that I think in a way, again, that's compassionate because we have to remember the reasons why they're doing this is because it's really anxiety provoking. And it's something that, again, if you've been in these groups, you know the anxiety and what it feels like, but it's easy to forget um, sometimes that people are always doing their best in these things. And so uh, naming it in such a way to be curious about the dynamic without having to uh, call it um, you know, dysfunctional in some ways, I think is really, uh, key in terms of how you use these interventions or group as a whole interventions uh, for folks. Uh, so the pairing group is the first connections that are created again that like Romeo and Juliet or you know whatever gender identities between them. Like if the pair works then we can have this like metaphorical baby. This new life will spring from the group. Everything will be worth it. The group survives. Um, and again, the, the goal there is not to just rely on those two people because it will not be as satisfying for everybody else, regardless of how much they think it will be in their fantasies. Um, and it will get old like, to feel like two people are taking the spotlight. So bridge other people in, find other ways to involve people in the discourse. Um, 
And again, oneness, the assumption of that members commit themselves to a higher cause. Um, they're very high cohesion, like cult-like almost in terms, like they don't perceive any differences between each other. I think this happens actually quite a lot. I mean, this may sound kind of extreme, but what I would frame it as is again, like um, everyone seems really nice here. You know, when you ask somebody like, who are you feeling most connected to? Almost always I get this oneness assumption of like, no, I trust everyone the same. Everyone's really great. And I will often name for the group, like, you know, when I hear you say that, like that everyone's really nice here, I agree with you, we're all super great. Like, but what I'm kind of curious about is, you know, when we get broad, like it's very safe because then there's nothing at risk. Uh, you know, we don't have to like offend anybody by leaving them out. We don't have to be intimate or closer to anybody like by like naming them specifically. And part of what we're doing in group is really wanting to like lean into this discomfort, these feelings that we tend to avoid. It's calamity that we think will happen if we say that. Oftentimes people will say like, I'm afraid of leaving people out if I say most connected to this person. Um, but notice that if you encourage them and if you're able to have someone challenged enough to name who they're most connected to and you say, why that person? Can you, can you tell them, can you talk to them and tell them why? And they'll say something really just heartfelt. Uh, a lot of the times they're like, well, you know, when you said that thing about uh, your mother, I've never had somebody really get me. Like I, I've been from like a, a broken home throughout my whole life. And uh, you know, it's been really hard to connect with people on that. And so I just felt really like you understood and, uh, you know, when you checked in on me later, it made me feel really cared for. Um, that has so much more meaning than I think everyone's great. But we still do that. I think everyone's great because again, like the, the, the feared suffering um, is so like intense that we'll avoid it at all costs. Um, the meanness is kind of the opposite problem uh, in that like the group <laughs> defies that it, it denies it even exists. Like we're just a bunch of individuals. There's nothing in common. Like we're all unique here. Um, and that's again, like the idea of holding your own identity and having very low cohesion. I imagine this would happen more in like groups that are like forced or mandated attendance. Like, um, I don't really see this as very problematic or, or something that happens a lot in the ways that I navigate groups. Um, the BART article, the one that talks about boundary authority, role and task. Uh, I'll list that if I don't in the description already, but um, Essentially, essentially, it's just a little acronym that helps go through some of these concepts. Um, boundary, like uh, is the container for the group, both physical and psychological. Um, and it clearly specifies like the what, when, and where of the location. Um, and your task boundary is like, what's the mission of the organization that you're uh, working with in this? So uh, the authority is who has the right to do the work? What's the formal and delegated authority? Uh, what's clearly defined? taken up by others and the company tools to exercise it. Again, like people make decisions in part because of the desires and fears that are correlated with the task at hand. Uh, and so oftentimes it's that fear of, um, like Dion will talk in these groups where people don't tend to learn from history. Like uh, at least that's like an adage that he uses or throws in there. Um, so the idea of taking authority or setting boundaries in the group can provide that additional sense of safety or certainty within this space. And if people have had poor decisions or things with these tasks related before, like understandably, they're gonna have uh, similar fears come up and get in the way of their productivity in that. Uh, the role is again, uh, roles that can be achieved, acquired, assigned, or ascribed to us by others related to our identity. And I think again, you have to take into those like systemic uh, oppression characteristics that can be assigning roles because those are still present as well. And naming those up front with people and being curious about it uh, as they come up will be really important. Um, the informal roles that like we might speak to is again, like is somebody being a caretaker, somebody being an antagonist, a quiet observer, practical one, the emotional one, and who's shifting into different roles, who's occupying multiple roles. Uh, the valence, the way it's described as a person's tendency to take up a particular role. And so there's an unconscious dynamic, again, like all for the sake of regulating distress or anxiety. Um, Mr. X feelings of anger are easily triggered. Thus he often becomes the problem member. Um, that's, I think what it would look like kind of in a vacuum, like, but again, 
like this, I feel like would be very different depending on the sociocultural like identities that the person holds, right? Like um, if you have um, somebody who's a um, international uh, student from, uh, you know, uh, Mongolia, then that's gonna have a lot of different effect, right? In terms of like what, what it means for them to be angered uh, easily compared to that of uh, a white male born in the US or um, you know a, a black woman there's all kinds of like ways in which you would want to be curious about not that the anger is the problem uh, in itself but recognizing and bringing curiosity to what causes this anger and what is the group or the system doing to cause that um, so rather than just having them be seen as the problematic member uh, and again, like there's a lot of talk in the books that I've been reading on power from um, Dalal, Fahad Dalal, that speaks to um, how you know, people in power uh, or groups in power tend to want to stay and perpetuate that power. And so recognizing that these things are going to happen in this group as well, right, with these different identities that we hold. So task has never been done before in this dynamic. The conflict arises when perceptions of the task differ from person to group, um, group to group, person to group. Uh, and the group relations calls us to be conscious of what we bring into the situation. So uh, they'll highlight that, you know, we often reenact past triumphs and tragedies. And um, I would argue, again, rather than like the, uh, like, oh, we're doing it to ourselves, uh, more so that, like, again, these group and these strings We've adapted to uh, be certain ways in the world. And so we naturalistically adapt to take care of ourselves in the best way that we know how. Um, so there will be phenomenon that you see in groups when people say, you know, I always feel misunderstood and they come into session. And sure enough, one of the first things they say, something really blunt and that could easily make them misunderstood. Uh, but that is purposeful, right? There's, even if it's not a conscious thing, because it's usually not, like there's something about, you know, when I have emotions, then again, I feel like I need to say something right. I might just keep rambling until I like, you know, um, I feel like I need to give some right answer or get some validation from someone. I don't know how else to get it because I wasn't given it before like um, in that way. And so keep talking, which lets me, you know, be seen as uh, too much or um, oppressive in that way. So trying to take this more from the sense of like, what is happening and how can we reflect on what narratives or you know, ties does that have in the past, I think can be really useful. Um, and they would say again, like in this repetition compulsion sense that if you don't resolve those things, um, then you'll seek to repeat that reality and get it confirmed again. So the goal is to pay attention and what is getting in the way of the task at this very moment. And then lastly, focused again, like on Tavistock leadership style, it's here and now, interpretation only. The non-interpretive remarks um, are, again, like a projection screen for the group. Like you're basically just saying what you think the group as a whole theme is. And everything the client says or does is an expression of that unconscious need to establish a particular relationship with others at that point. And you do not use outside events, outside relationships, past events, and interpretations. Just talk about what's happening in the room. Um, Focusing on the unconscious patterns of the group is the goal of that and naming those basic assumptions or the things associated with it. And again, the leader, because of this like different way of being present, it's often seen as aloof or disconnected, literally outside the circle. And uh, like I mentioned before, the three-tiered interpretation, what is the group talking about? Uh, what enables them to avoid this expression and what do they fear might happen if they engage in that avoided expression? So. That was a quick overview, but thank you all for your time and going through that today.